Question 31. Which of the following forms of market structures does a firm make output and pricing decisions based on the anticipated actions of its competitors? So we've got oligopoly, monopoly, and perfect competition. Um, so for perfect competition, we can go ahead and rule that one out right away. Um, perfect In a perfect competition, for all the firms are price takers. And so there's not really any room to make pricing decisions. If you price your product higher than the next competitor, which is essentially selling the same widget, um, you're not going to make any sales. So there's really no pricing decision to make. You're just taking what the market gives you. Uh, B, we can also go ahead and rule out because in a monopoly, you don't really have competitors. Um, so you're a price maker and you make decisions based on your own profit maximization output. Um, not really having to take competitors into account. So that leaves us with A, oligopoly, which does make sense. Um, this is a market where there's going to be a few competitors, but the products aren't very dif differentiated, so you will have to kind of game um, the system on the uh, output and pricing that you're going to put out there. So we'll go with A, oligopoly. Question 32. You are given the following exchange rates. So we've got Euro USD, um, Swiss francs USD, yen Swiss francs, yen Canadian, and pound Canadian. And we need to find pound Euro. <laughs> so we've got pound all the way down here, and we've got Euro all the way up here, and we need to end up with uh, pound Euro. So it looks like we're basically going to have to be multiplying each of these five different exchange rates together in order to get to our answer. So let's take a look at what that's going to look like. Um, so we're always going to be, we always need to flip the, uh, we want GBP pound in our numerator. And then, so our ending value should be what we want finally in the denominator. So we've got euro in the denominator down here. So to start with what we've got, we've got pound CAD. So then to get this into yen, the CAD, the the, cat, the denominator needs to be in the numerator for what you're multiplying by next, essentially. So to get to pound yen, we need to multiply by cad yen. Um, and then to get to pound Swiss franc, the, the uh, denominator of yen needs to be in the numerator in the next one, and so on. Um, so we'll have uh, pound Canadian to start, which we're given. And then we need CAD JPY, which is not given. So we're going to need to go on the go inverse on this one. Um, yen Swiss we are given, so we'll just plug that in. Uh, Swiss USD we're also given, so we can plug that right in. And then Euro or USD Euro um, we're given the inverse, so we'll need to invert that one when we multiply. So pulling all that in here. Um, we can see we're inverting the two that we mentioned, and then we're taking the other three and just multiplying gives us 0.9486, so we will go with answer B. Question 33. The main advantage of a permissionless network over a permission network is that A. It is open to any user who wishes to execute a transaction. Um, permissionless networks are certainly more accessible um, and so this could be our answer. Um, let's uh, take a look at the others, though, first. So B, transactions do not undergo central validation processes. Um, this is definitely touted as a key advantage. Um, permissionless networks are decentralized, so they're validated via a consensus mechanism by basically other members or people on the platform. Um, so this seems like it could be an answer as well. Let's take a look at C. It consumes less computer power and is easier to create um, because it has to be validated via the me consensus mechanism. It's going to take up uh, a lot more computer power. Um, this is a pretty, this is something that some ESG folks are kind of using against the uh, Bitcoin community these days. Um, so we'll cross that off uh, and look back at these. So these both seem like they could be correct. Um, we're going to lean towards B, though, since the uh, wording says a main advantage of that type of network. 
Um, so while A is definitely a feature, uh, being accessibility, um, the uh, decentralization is really a, the key uh, advantage of the permission network. Um, trust isn't required by that central um, third party where you're uh, decentralized in the validation process. So we'll go with B. Question 34. Which of the following is least likely a reason for investors to pay attention to the stage in the credit cycle? So two of these are going to be reasons to look for... Uh, to pay attention to the credit cycle, and one will not. A, it helps them better anticipate policymakers' actions. So looking at the credit cycle can help us better anticipate actions. Um, for example, if there's lots of defaults or credit spreads are getting wider or blowing out, um, this would indicate that we're, go we're potentially in or going into a recession. Um, which would lead us to believe that policymakers are probably going to be stimulating the economy. Um, so that's one way, one example that kind of tells us how that can help us anticipate. B, credit cycles tend to be longer, deeper, and sharper than business cycles. This is definitely a characteristic of credit cycles, but it doesn't really sound like um, a reason for us to pay attention or something as useful from an investment standpoint. So we'll tentatively circle B, but let's just make sure we can cross off C. It helps them assess the extent of business cycle expansions as well as contractions. This is certainly important because um, it, whether we're in an expansion or a contraction is going to be important for the types of businesses um, that we're making with our investments. Um, so we can go ahead and cross off C as well and go with B. Question 35, what is the most likely policy response to a high inflation rate due to supply shocks? So if we've got high inflation, this generally would mean that um, the central bank would want to be restrictive because it means the economy is running too hot. They want to cool inflation down, so they might do something like raise interest rates um, in order to kind of slow economic activity and bring inflation down to a more sustainable rate. So that's going to be uh, restrictive monetary policy. So we can go ahead and cross off A right away since this is expansionary monetary policy. We wouldn't want to stimulate the economy necessarily um, if we're getting high inflation. In fact, we most likely would not want to. Uh, B, contractionary monetary policy. Uh, this sounds like it could be our answer, but let's take a look at C. There is no exact policy prescription. Um, so B could be our answer in uh, the scenario where this is inflation due to demand side, which is primarily what the Fed or central bank is going to be able to help with. Um, demand side indicates that it's inflation is happening because there's too much economic activity. Consumers are buying too much stuff, essentially. Um, and businesses as well are investing more. So that's creating the inflation, which is where if the Fed raises interest rates, credit's now more expensive and can kind of tighten up some of that spending. When it's coming from the supply side, this is going to be a larger issue where it may be due to lack of resources or supply chain issues. This is pretty much exactly what happened after COVID um, in the aftermath there where the uh, supply chains were all messed up because businesses weren't open, so they weren't able to complete their products. Uh, and so the products that they were able to complete were being priced a lot higher because there was a su demand supply imbalance. Um, so if it were demand side, we could go with B, but since it's supply side, there's not going to be an exact policy prescription, it's going to be um, more dependent on the actual situation and what um, what's causing the inflation from the supply side. So we'll go with C, no exact policy prescription. Question 36, from the following return observations, the return that lies at the 25th percentile is closest to. So we've got a data set of numbers here. Um, so let's pull in our formula that we'll be using for this. So we essentially need to first figure out where, what uh, spot in the order our number is going to fall into for the 25th percentile. 
Um, so we'll have n plus 1. So n is going to be our number of observations. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we'll have 7 plus 1 here. And then our y is going to be the percentile. So that'll be 25. So we can pull that in. We can pull that in here. With those numbers plugged in. We can see that gives us 2. So this is telling us where in the order um, we're going to choose from. And since this is a whole number, we know that we're going to be able to pick just one of our numbers from the data set. We won't have to extrapolate between the two. Um, so next step from here then is simply to just order the returns from lowest to highest. And 25th percentile is going to be um, that second number, so 1.9 and then 3.3 .3 will be our answer. We'll go with A. Question 37. An analyst gathered the following information about a company. So we've got um, cash, accounts receivable, inventories, accounts payable, sales, cost of goods sold, and all of their dollar values. The company's cash conversion cycle is closest to. So for cash conversion cycle, um, we're, our answers are all in days, so we're going to need to convert these, uh, this should be minus, sorry about that. So we're going to need to convert these dollars that we're given here in order to, um, into days so that we can calculate that conversion cycle. So we're going to need number of days inventory, we're going to add number of days receivables to that, and then we're going to subtract number of days payable. Um, so from here, put this up here, uh, so we've got number of days inventory on hand. Um, we're going to be doing 365 times the amount of inventory that we have, which is just over 1 million, and then dividing that by cost of goods sold, which is uh, that 2.542 million. That gives us 143.87, and then it's going to be similar concept for each of them. Um, so we've got 365 times account receivables over sales. And then for accounts payable, 365 times accounts payable over um, cost of goods sold. So just uh, something to note, for the inventory in, pay in accounts payable, we're using cost of goods sold um, because cost of goods sold is an indication of kind of what we're paying our vendors. Um, or our suppliers, so the cost, of, so the inventory is more directly related to um, the cost of goods sold because the inventory is what we're paying the suppliers. Um, whereas accounts receivable, we have sales in the denominator because um, accounts receivable is what we have sold, and we're just waiting to collect on. Um, so we get 143.87 for inventory, like we said, 114.45 for receivables, and then 103.45 for payables. Um, so we then just go back down to this formula here, and we'll add uh, inventory and receivables, subtract out the payables. We get 144.87, round it to 155, and we'll go with answer B. Question 38. An analyst gathered the following information about Yeezny. So we've got uh, income tax expense of $120,000 and then change in the tax deferred assets of $1,500. So it looks like uh, tax deferred asset went up by $1,500 and then change in deferred tax liability that went up by $5,000. So Yeezny's income tax payable is closest to. So um, change in deferred tax assets starting with that. So deferred tax asset increasing means that we're paying taxes now and we're able to make that a, an asset because we think we'll potentially get that money back later. Um, so since we're paying that tax now, this is going to add to the tax expense of 120000 and then deferred tax liability is going to be the exact opposite. So we're paying less tax now, um, but anticipating that we'll have to pay that later, which is why it creates a liability. It's a liability because it's something we'll potentially owe in the future. Um, 
So with that in mind, basically what we just need to do to get our answer then is we're going to add the 1500 to the 120 and then we'll subtract out the 5000 gives us 116500 for what we're actually going to have to pay for what we're actually paying in this period. Um, so that uh, gives us answer A. Question 39. A firm reported the following. So we've got uh, net income, non-cash charges, interest expense, capex, and tax rate. The company's free cash flow to the firm is closest to. So let's pull in our free cash flow to the firm formula. Um, so I pulled in the one using net, starting with net income since uh, that's what we're given here. In, in certain instances, you'd be able to just start with the cash flow from operations, um, but here we need to start with net income. So we're going to take that net income, add back our non-cash charges, and then add back our interest expense times 1 minus that tax rate. So we'll take into account the tax rate there. Interest expense we're given, non-cash charges we're also given, net income we're given. And then we're going to subtract out the capex and working capex. Um, we're not given anything for working capital expenditures, so we'll just need to subtract out that 150 for the capital expenditure. Um, so we pull that in here and plug the numbers in like we had, 2 million plus 70,000 plus the 200,000 interest expense times 1 minus 0.45 minus 150,000 brings us to 2.03 million, which gives us answer A. Question 40. In 2014, Nova Incorporated reported $12.5 million in free cash flow to the firm, $1.5 million in interest, and $3.5 million in net borrowing. If its corporate tax rate was 22%, its free cash flow to equity was closest to. So this is a good question to uh, understand the differences or changes going from free cash flow to the firm to free cash flow to equity. And the main difference is going to be how the debt is accounted for. Um, so in free cash flow to equity, we're going to subtract out the uh, interest expense. So we'll take that interest expense of 1.5 million, uh, multiply it by one minus the corporate tax rate of 22%. And then we're just going to add back the uh, net borrowing. So we've got the 12.5 million free cash flow. We're subtracting out um, that interest expense and then adding back the net borrowing gives us $14.83 million. I think for these free cash flow add to equity and free cash flow to the firm, there's a lot of different starting points that you can have, whether it's starting from net income, starting from cash flow from operations. Um, and so I think it's good to have, or starting from free cash flow in this instance, it's good to have flashcards for each of these made up so that you can kind of um, know what the free cash flow to equity formula is or free cash flow to the firm formula is based on the uh, kind of starting earnings that you're given in the questions because they're going to mix it up and it'll vary from question to question. So we've got answer C.